Hello, Mr. Barton here. And in this video, I seek to answer the question, what makes a good diagnostic question? Now, the kind of golden rules that I'm gonna lay down here aren't definitive by any means. And there's lots of schools of thought on this, but these are simply the criteria that I think of myself whenever I'm A, writing a diagnostic question, or B, deciding whether to use somebody else's. So here we go. These are Mr. Barton's four golden rules. Number one, they can be answered in no more than 20 seconds. Now, the reason I've chosen that is because I think if a child's thinking for much more than 20 seconds, almost by definition, they're making multiple leaps in their thinking. And as soon as they start to make multiple leaps or multiple steps, it's very hard to pin down where the specific misconception lies. And that's what diagnostic questions are all about, identifying the specific misconception. So these should be short, snappy questions. And 20 seconds is just my kind of rough benchmark, ideally even quicker than that. What's golden rule number two? Well, these questions shouldn't be multi-step questions. And this is related in a way to point one, because as soon as questions are multi-step questions, it becomes very hard to identify where the misconception lies. Now, before you're thinking, oh, flipping it, that's gonna wipe out a load of different questions I want to ask. I'm gonna show you in a later video how you can cleverly twist the concept of multi-step questions and turn them into ideal diagnostic questions. But the purpose of rule two is, once again, to identify the specific point in the skill the student's going wrong, it probably makes sense to have these non-multi-step questions, single skills. What's golden rule number three? This is crucial. You should be able to learn something from every incorrect answer. There shouldn't be any redundant answers in there. So if a child answers B and B's wrong, just from their answer, you should be able to tell something about the child's way of thinking. Okay? And the final rule, and often this is the hardest, it is not possible to get the correct answer while still holding misconceptions. Now I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of what I mean by that to illustrate it. This is a question that I wrote. Um, which of these is a multiple of six? And I'm gonna be honest with you, it's not a very good question, but why? Feel free to pause the video and analyze this, have a chat to somebody about it, and then come back and we'll talk about it in a bit. So why do, am I not a big fan of this question? I mean, it's got one right answer, C, C's right, 24. That's always a big tick there, three wrong answers. I also quite like D, 26, that's not a bad answer. Maybe multiple students think multiples end in six. B's not the worst answer I've ever seen either. Maybe students think multiples begin with the number, so 62. A's not great. I mean, what do I learn from A? Do I learn anything about the student's way of thinking? But that's not the main reason this isn't a very good question. Just think, of, uh, put yourself in the shoes of a child. You come into your maths lesson, and you see on the board today, we're gonna to be studying factors and multiples. And you think to yourself, oh, flipping heck, I am useless at those because I'm always muddling them up. I never know which is a factor, which is a multiple. Well, then you see this question, you're laughing because there's no factors on there. So you could have students get this question right who do not know the difference between factors and multiples, which is arguably the biggest misconception in this area of maths. So it's possible to get this question right while still holding a major misconception. What's a better way of asking that? Well, I think that's a better question. Which of these is a multiple of eight? Again, notice now we've got A, a factor in there. We've got B, the correct answer. We've got C, so students may think multiples end in that number. And we've got D, where students may think multiples begin with that number. A much better question. And also this, this is one of my all time favorite questions on the site. Which of these is a factor of 27? I love that question. If you ask that, it really tests whether students have a solid understanding of factors. Let me show you one more example. All right, again, another question I wrote. What's wrong with this question? Again, feel free to pause the video. Okay, so once again, put yourself in the shoes of a student coming into this lesson and they see that the lesson's about decimals and ordering decimals and they think, oh, flipping, like I'm useless at ordering decimals. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a chance that that child is gonna get this question right. Because if the child just thinks to themselves, well, 27 is bigger than two, 15 and 23, they're gonna go for B, 0.27, but they may not have any understanding whatsoever of place value specific to decimals. So it's possible to get this question right while still holding a major misconception. 
Whereas, if I ask that question, it's by far a more difficult question, and more difficult doesn't necessarily mean better, but in this case, I think it does. Because for a child to get this question right, they've got to have a really deep knowledge of place value when it comes to ordering decimals. So, they're my golden rules for what makes a good diagnostic question. As I say, they're just my golden rules. Other people may have their own, but I reckon they're a pretty decent guide. Take care. See you in a bit.